Hello, everyone. Ben Sadler here. I uh, want to continue our Bible studies. Um, in the past, I've done, I was doing a study through Matthew, and, and every week I feel like we're getting a, a little bit better. And, and now after Easter, I wanted to do just a deeper dive into the previous sermon text. And I've always appreciated this uh, when, when pastors have, have, have kind of broken things down a little bit more. There's always so much in a sermon text that you can't do in, a, in, in the sermon. And and a sermon is a little bit different. You know, when, when you preach in a sermon, you're trying to make one point, you're trying to really motivate, you're trying to really connect. Uh, but man, there's so much that goes on kind of behind the scenes in preparation for the sermon that you really, you, you can't say from the pulpit, it's too overwhelming, there's too much information, you really need to make one point. And so in these studies, if, I don't know if this is something that would help you or, or you would like, but what I'm going to try to do is, is, is show you a little bit more behind the scenes, things that weren't able to make the sermon uh, but really, hopefully, do uh, give give more background and and can be helpful. So, I'm just going to uh, say a quick prayer, and then we'll get into uh, our study. Lord God, thank you for uh, this time to this morning, uh, this time during this day to, to to dig into God's word and to 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 learn more about what you want us to know and believe. Pray that you would use this to further uh, your kingdom. Pray that you would bless the people listening, that they would be different people, and don't let anything I'm doing get in the way of your word. Okay. So I uh, just wanted to go, jump to our sermon text uh, for Easter. So last Sunday was the best day of the year, Easter. And, and so I preached on John chapter 20, uh, this idea that, that on Easter evening, the disciples were all together, but the doors were locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. And you think about that, we're we're all locked in our homes right now. Uh, you know, we're, we're the stay-at-home policy because of the coronavirus and the pandemic. And, and so I, I wonder if, if this is a big feeling that we all are going through right now, fear. Uh, they, they were afraid of the, the, the Jewish leaders because the Jewish leaders had taken Jesus and, and man, just brought him through uh, the court system, through the Roman court system, and had him crucified overnight. And so they had this fear that maybe they were next. And, uh, you know, they saw Jesus die. They wanted, they, they were afraid that maybe they were the next ones to die. And, and the sermon uh, really wanted to emphasize that idea that maybe that's kind of what you're, you're going through also. Uh, this idea of fear. Uh, you, you see the, the death count on, on the news on how many people are dying or getting sick because of the coronavirus. Um, you, you see the businesses closing down, people losing their jobs. Um, you think about your loved ones who might be at higher risk. And so there's all these fears, fears of, of, of having people you love get hurt, fear of losing things financially, fear of when is this going to end. And, um, and then ultimately, the fear of death, either for ourselves or somebody else. And, and so there is this fear, and in the middle of the locked locked doors in the middle of these in this room jesus came and stood among them and says peace be with you peace be with you shalom would have been the hebrew way of saying that greeting it meant so many different things he alive and if he's alive everything's okay um and so i really emphasize that in the sermon but one thing i didn't emphasize was this section right here i didn't talk about this at all i, I actually skipped over it intentionally because it brought in a whole new thought that i knew wouldn't be um just wouldn't have time to really explain it um i think when you hear a sermon if you have like a five-point sermon or 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 or, or two or three main points, you walk away kind of disoriented. And so I really try my sermons to bring home one point. And so the one point uh, in this last sermon was, uh, we have fear, but Jesus gives us peace. But I think there was another feeling that the disciples were going through that I did not bring up, and that was regret. The last time the disciples had been with Jesus, they had promised Jesus that even if everybody, you know, they would never fall away. And Peter doubled down on that. He says, even if, if, if everybody else falls away, I never will. And Jesus says, yes, you will. You all fall away on account of me. And that's what they did. They, they didn't have what it takes. They fell away when Jesus needed them most. And so uh, really, you know, kind of show themselves unfit for the ministry, unfit for Jesus' kingdom. They, they were bad 
uh, bad sheep, bad shepherds, they, they, they ran away when it got tough. And so you might assume that when Jesus shows up after the resurrection, he would say, shame on you, you're fired, uh, don't need you anymore, you weren't there when I needed you, I, I'm not going to use you anymore, you're, you're, you're worthless. But Jesus says, peace be with you. And then he says, again, Jesus said, peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, the Father gave me a mission, sent me to this earth, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's, anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. That's the essence of, 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 of ministry, is to forgive people's sins, is to point out when they're living in sin. It's, it's um, confession absolution. It's, it's, it's calling out when somebody's living an unrepentant life that's separating them from God and, and tell them your sins are not forgiven. Right now. You're, sep you're living a life separated from God. And, and, and to those who are repentant, those who are broken, to tell them in Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. So what Jesus is doing here is reinstating the disciples back into the ministry. What he's saying is, although you failed, you're not a failure. I heard a pastor say that last week in, in, a, in a podcast. I, he didn't know who he's even quoting, and, 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 but this powerful quote, um, failure is an event, not a person. You might have the event of failure, but that's, a, that's, an, that's an event. It's not a person. You're not a failure, even if you might have failed. And that's what's so beautiful about this section is that you can think back on your previous failures and think, I let Jesus down. I screwed up in that part of my life. I was not faithful. I denied him. Jesus must be done with me. But Jesus shows up to his closest followers who he had prepared for three years. And after they failed, he says, peace be with you. Not only have I forgiven you, I'm resurrecting your ministry. As, God, as the Father sent me, I am sending you. As the Father sent me, I am sending you. Um, and so he's saying, I'm, I'm putting you back in the ministry. And the essence of the ministry is to be filled with the Holy Spirit and go around forgiving sins or, or bringing people to repentance who, are, who are, are living in sin. That's the essence of what a pastor does, essence of what uh, ministers do. Okay. Then the whole account of, of, of them talking to Thomas. Thomas was not there, and, and they said to Thomas, we have seen the Lord, but, but he says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails are, I will not believe. Um, you know, Thomas is asking for more evidence. And, and one thing that kind of struck me this year is, is evidence is not a bad thing. You know, there is evidence here. 10 of your best friends all tell you uh, that we have seen the Lord. There's evidence here, evidence that Jesus predicted this would happen, the evidence of the empty tomb. There's enough evidence here, and yet Thomas wants more. And we see this throughout the ministry that the, the Pharisees, right after Jesus feeds the 5,000, uh, the Pharisees says, we want more miracles. We want more signs. Uh, Moses gave gave the nation of Israel manna from heaven. What are you going to do? And Jesus could have said, well, I just fed the 5,000. What, what more do you want? But there is this feeling inside of us that, that the skeptical questioning, I want more evidence. I want more proof. I want more evidence. And that's kind of where Thomas is at right now. Unless I see the nail marks, I want physical evidence. I want to touch things. I want to see it with my own eyes. Well, a week later, Jesus shows up. He says, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put on my side, stop doubting and believe. How much more evidence do you want? And Thomas, almost in a word of confession, says, my Lord and my God. He sees that Jesus is not just his Lord in the sense of, 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 of a master. Jesus is God. He could see Thomas doubts. He could see his questioning and he came and confronted him on that questioning, something only God would know how to do. So beautiful testimony to who, who God is. And then Jesus says this to Thomas and really to us, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Not a blind faith, just saying, 
believe based on what God has given you. And he's given you enough in the word. He's given you enough in history. He's given you enough um, to believe. And so believe based on the evidence that God has given you. And, and then John doubles down on the evidence. He kind of summarizes the section, section, Jesus performed many other signs. This is um, uh, an attribute of the book of John, signs. Um, all, a lot of the other writers say um, miracles, like Matthew, Mark, and Luke would talk about miracles. Uh, I think John exclusively says signs. Signs are, as a way to say miracles, were signs pointing this head to something. When you look at a sign, you drive into Victory of the Lamb, you see the sign there. The sign points you into the building. You don't stop at the sign. Jesus' miracles were not an end in themselves. John says they were signs pointing it to something greater, um, that, that, that Jesus is greater than his miracles. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is God. He's the Messiah. So that's what John says. Jesus put forward many other signs that pointed, uh, signs of presence of the disciples, that pointed to who Jesus is. And they're not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe. Jesus is the Messiah. These signs are written to point you to Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And by believing, you may have life, life right now, um, direction, purpose, life. Okay. Now, I wanted to take some time to really focus on this whole other idea, not just of fear, but of regret. And so uh, this is the John chapter, I'm going to focus on John chapter 21, but I want to set the scene by going to John 18, 18. Um, the last time that, or there, there's, there's a time in, in John's gospel that he uses this, this word charcoal fire. And it's the only time up to this point in the book of John that we get this, this word charcoal fire. Now the slaves and the officers were standing there having made a charcoal fire for it was cold and they were warming themselves. And Peter was also with them standing and warming himself. So this is right before Jesus was crucified. Um, Jesus on trial in the Sanhedrin. And Peter walks up close there and he, he warms himself by a charcoal fire. And then we know what happens. A servant girl comes up to him and questions him, say, hey, you're one of those Jesus followers. And he says, I don't know what you're talking about. And he denies Jesus three times in front of a servant girl, in front of these, these, these people who really don't have any power to hurt Peter. Uh, he shows weak faith. He denied Jesus, just like he said. And, and we, we hear that Peter went out and wept bitterly. He was overcome with guilt and regret. And you can imagine uh, Jesus predicted he would fall away. Peter doubled down and says, I, I, even if I have to die, I will never deny you. He did deny Jesus three times. And so now after the resurrection in John chapter 21, Jesus really wants to address this whole idea of regret. And, and Jesus could have went up to the disciples and say, I forgive you for your sin. But instead what Jesus does is he shows them that he wants them. He shows them that he has a plan for them. And he recreates powerful scenes in the disciples' lives in order to recreate this scene. And, and here's what I think is so important. Like, um, if Jesus did this for the disciples, what does he want to do for you? And, and this is just a powerful idea. Let me just kind of walk through this and, and show you how Jesus responds to the regret. So afterward, Jesus appeared again to the disciples. So he appeared uh, when they were locked in, a, in, in, in that room. He appeared to Thomas when they were locked in the room. And now here's the third appearance. Afterwards, Jesus appeared to, again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel, from Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and the other two disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go out with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Now, when have we heard of another event where these disciples went out fishing and they caught nothing? The first time that Jesus called them into the ministry. When Jesus called them into the ministry, they were fishing and they caught nothing. Well, let's look what Jesus is doing after the resurrection. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, have you had any fish? No, they answered. 
He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of a large number of fish. <gasps> See what Jesus is doing? He's recreating that event. He is, um, he's giving them a large catch of fish, the time when he had them catch a large catch of fish, and he told them, uh, you're no longer going to fish for fish, you're going to fish for people. I'm going to make you my disciples, and I will teach you how to fish for people. And they might have thought, all right, yeah, Jesus called us into the ministry a, a, a long time ago, three years ago, but we failed. We're failures. He must not need us in his ministry anymore, must not want us anymore in his kingdom. And Jesus recreates the scene of the large catch of fish, reminding them that I'm not done with you yet. Just like he said in John chapter 20, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. I'm reinstating you. I still want you. And now he deals with Peter in a very personal way. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard this, him say, it's the Lord. He wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, jumped into the water, and the other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish. And they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals, a charcoal fire there with fish on it and some bread. Uh, just a quick note here. The, the disciple whom Jesus loved is how John the writer identifies himself. I don't think it was because John was more loved than the other disciples, but but that's how he identified himself. And wasn't, wouldn't that just be a wonderful way that if that's how we got up in the morning and said, I'm the one Jesus loves. That would keep us from pride. I'm better than anybody. No, I'm not better than anybody. But it also keep us from despair. Um, I'm, it's not like I'm unworthy. I'm just the one Jesus loves by grace, but I'm not, I'm not well filled himself with pride. He's not, I'm not with despair. Probably the answer to all of our identity issues today is if we would just identify ourselves as the one Jesus loves. But back to this whole idea. So Jesus gathers Peter around a charcoal fire. Why would he do this? Let's jump down here to verse 15. When they had finished eating, they eating breakfast, Jesus made a great breakfast after the resurrection of fish. They finished eating breakfast. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? The word here, love, is, is agape. Um, and, and it just, it means a, a love of, of full commitment, a love that's not waiting for anything in return. It's, it's a love, hopefully you, you find in a marriage, the love of God, a one-way kind of love. Where, where it's a love maybe between a parent and a child. A parent gives everything to the child, not really expecting anything in return. And he's saying, John, do you love me more than these? Remember, Peter was the one who said, even if everyone falls away, I never will. Well, he didn't do that. He showed himself to be a chump like everybody else. And now he's saying, how about now? Do you love me more than anyone else? Uh, uh, are, and, and he says, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Now, the word that Peter uses here is phileo, another, another Greek word for love. There are three Greek words for love, eros, agape, and phileo. And, and, and eros is that kind of erotic love, a passionate, romantic love. Agape is this kind of one-way love, a love between a parent and a child. And phileo is this friendly love like uh, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Um, phileo is, is that word um, here. And so he says, yes, Lord, you know that I'm your friend. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Do the ministry I want you to do. Take care of God's people. Again, she said, Simon, son of John, do you agape me? Do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that we're friends. I love you. She says, take care of my sheep. Be a pastor. Watch over the flock. Third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you phileo me? Um, do, you, do you love me? Um, like a friend. Are we friends? Peter was hurt because Jesus had, asked him a third time. Peter's like, all right, I get what you're saying. We're at a fire. I'm getting asked three times if I know you, if I love you, if we're friends. I see what you're doing, Jesus. And he says he was hurt, you know, just emotionally moved 
Um, it's bringing up the past, but not bringing up the past to really hurt Peter. It's bringing up the past to reinstate him. Do you love me? Are we friends? Jesus says, finally, he uses that fill out word that Peter's been using. Are we friends? He said, Lord, you know all things. You really know my heart now. You know that we're friends. You know that I love you. You know that, that, that I will follow you now. And so Jesus closes by saying, feed my sheep. He's reinstating them. He's already said this in, in the previous section, you know, as, as a father has sent me, I'm sending you. But this, this personal touch that Jesus is, is recreating that scene where Peter denied Jesus three times and now reinstating him and saying, I have work for you to do. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. I know you are filled with fear because of the Jews, and I know you're filled with regret because you denied me. I'm going to respond to your fear with love and peace, and I'm going to respond to your regret by reinstating you into the ministry. And now he, he says, you know what? You're going to need this kind of confidence. You're going to need uh, to be devoted to me because this is what's going to happen to you. This is very true. I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Peter, according to church history, was crucified upside down by the emperor Nero. Uh, Nero was the Roman emperor, and, and Peter testified to the fact that he saw Jesus alive, that he, he believed that he, he was a Christian because he saw Jesus alive. And, and so according to the, the ancient stories and the, the church history, uh, Peter was not crucified like Jesus. He says, I'm not worthy to be crucified like Jesus. And so he was crucified upside down. And so sometimes when you see depictions of Peter, you'll see an upside down cross as an as a, a indication of the kind of faithfulness that Peter had and the kind of devotion he had. And that's what we see. Uh, Jesus closes out by saying to Peter, follow me. And he did. It wasn't that he was perfect, Peter. We see Peter kind of um, uh, stumbling uh, when Paul recounts an interaction he had with Peter in the book of Galatians. But as far as uh, staying faithful to Jesus, and trusting in Jesus and not denying Jesus, even to death, even to death on a cross, an upside down cross, Peter was faithful. Now I want you to think about the implications in your life. When were you maybe unfaithful and you feel like God is done with me? I failed and so I'm a failure and I'm not worthy to serve Jesus. I'm not worthy to, 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 to speak about Jesus, to care about of the kingdom, to work in his ministry, to tell my neighbor about Jesus, to tell my children about Jesus, to, to pass this good news on to somebody else. Do you feel like because you failed in the past, you're a failure? Well, look at how far Jesus is going to say, I'm reinstating you. Um, I'm using sinners because sinners are all that this world has. I'm using people who failed because people who failed are is all that this world has. And so where are the places that Jesus needs to take you back to? Jesus took Peter back to the charcoal fire, asked him the three questions, and gave him a chance to, 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 to reenact that story. What stories need to be maybe reenacted in your life? And you need to see Jesus there forgiving you for the things that you did in your past and saying, your past does not d d define your future. You don't need to reminisce or uh, muse over your past anymore. You can walk with Jesus. Follow me. Um, and so I just, I think it's a, such a powerful scene of how far Jesus would go to convince um, the disciples, especially Peter, that they don't need to live in the regrets of the past. Because Jesus lived, because Jesus died, and most of all, because Jesus rose, we're resurrected. We'll be resurrected on the last day when Jesus returns and resurrects our world and resurrects our bodies and makes everything new. But right now, you're resurrected. Your life is being resurrected. Okay. And, um, and, and maybe here's just another quick little point I, I kind of wanted to make. Peter turned and saw the, the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. Uh, and he talks about who that is. Who is this disciple whom Jesus loved? We've already said that's John. That's John. When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? What's going to happen to John, the writer of this gospel? He says, if I want him to re remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. 
Because of this, a ru rumor spread among the believers that the disciples, that, the, that, that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say he would not die, only that if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? So John is kind of speaking about himself, that there was this rumor that John wasn't going to die. Well, um, that's not what he's saying. Uh, John would just not die a martyr's death. All the other disciples, the 11, or the, the, the 11 remaining disciples, that um, they all, according to church history, died a martyr's death. You know, John, uh, I mean, uh, Peter was crucified upside down. Thomas supposedly made it to India, and he was martyred in India. Uh, and so there's all these different stories of how the early Christians died. But John, he was exiled for his faith by the emperor uh, Domitian, I think you say his name. Um, he was exiled to the island of Patmos where he had that vision of the book of Revelation. And so he had all these visions of, 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 of what was happening then and what would happen in the future. And it seems like he was released from prison and exile in the island of Patmos. And he died uh, in an old age. Um, as a pastor of a church and a leader of the church. So that's a little bit of a, some background about John. And John probably wrote this gospel in his old age. So Matthew, Mark, Luke wrote their gospels, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 AD, 10, 20, 30 years after the event happened. Mark probably was the first writer, the first gospel to be produced. And then Matthew and Luke seem to use Mark as their template. And Matthew uh, changes the structure a little bit to tell the story, to kind of uh, tell it from uh, structuring it kind of like the books of Moses um, and, and using tons of Old Testament prophecies uh, to prove that Jesus is the Christ. Luke uh, says that he, in the beginning of the book of Luke, says that he looked at lots of different um, other uh, people's writings and, 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 and looked at lots of different, um, investigated thoroughly. And he seems to add other details, but basically they're, um, Matthew, Mark, Luke are called synoptic gospels because they're basically the same story. John, writing later on, assumes that you probably have read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and he's kind of filling in the details. And that's why at the end of his book, he says, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose even the whole world would not have room for uh, the books that could be written. You know, but, she, but John wrote down what he needed to write down. He could have written about lots of different things, but he wrote down what he wrote down to fill in the gaps for what Matthew, Mark, and Luke didn't seem to focus on, but mostly so that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ. So hopefully that's helpful as we recapped the, 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 these two ideas, uh, the idea in the sermon that, that Jesus meets your fear of right now with his peace. You, you're, you, you might be locked in your homes, afraid of death, afraid of loss, of of finances, a loss of, of, of all these different things, uh, fear of the future, when is this going to end? And Jesus meets us in the middle of our fear with his presence as we read his word. And, and that gives us enough evidence to follow him. But also I wanted to talk about this other feeling that the disciples feel and we might feel uh, that keeps us kind of paralyzed of regrets. The disciples screwed it up, they fail, but it doesn't mean they're a failure. We've screwed it up. It, we fail, but doesn't mean we're a failure. And Jesus reinstates them. As the Father sent me, I'm sending you, Jesus says. And then he recreates their, the time he commissioned them, gave them a large catch of fish, saying, hey, let's do this over. And he takes Peter to a charcoal fire, says, Peter, let's do this over. And, and so I want you to see yourself being reinstated today, resurrected today. You have a good reason to, to, to be motivated to action, to love your family, love your neighbors, to serve the people. Uh, serve the people around you uh, to the glory of God. I hope that's helpful. Um, I, I, and, and we're going to continue these studies. We'll see you next Wednesday. And I think this will be, um, <laughs> we'll keep working on this. And, and I, hopefully I'll come out and, and, and speak at 7 a.m. like I said I was going to. And I pray now that, that, that you have a wonderful day. I'm going to close with a blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, our resurrected Lord, and the love of God, who's reinstated us into his ministry, into his kingdom. Um, guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Have a great day, guys. Thank you so much. Love teaching. Love you guys. Adios, amigos.